We're live. This is always the awkward moment where it doesn't show up on YouTube yet because there's like a 20 second delay, but I'm hoping uh, we're going. So hello, hello, and welcome to another session of Kyoto Startup Weekend. Uh, Startup Weekend Kyoto Sessions. This is volume five. We apologize. We weren't on last week, even though we kind of promised. Um, some schedules fell through and we ended up taking a two week break instead of one. But yeah, we are back. Um, my name is Sushi Suzuki. I'm one of the organizers slash facilitators of Startup Weekend Kyoto. And as you can tell, we're actually bringing you today's session in English. Um, hello, Saomura-san. Nice to see you comment. So yeah, let's get started. Thank you everyone for joining and thank you Toma for joining. So thank today you. I am with Toma Batran, who is the CEO, founder of Ship & Co and Bento & Co, I guess in the other order. Um, very active startup and e-commerce company in Kyoto. So I'm here to talk to him about how it is founding a company as not a Japanese person in Japan and also in this city. So thank you very much for joining me and yeah, let's get started. Could you give us a little bit of introduction to yourself as well as the two sure. companies you run? Sure. So uh, my name is Thomas and I'm from France, but living in Japan and in Kyoto for 17 years now. I came here as a graduate student at Kyoto University. I thought I'd be here for one year and I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so back in 2005, I started a blog just to tell about my you know, life in Japan, life in Kyoto. And this blog became quite popular among French people who, who love Japanese culture and just gave me the idea to sell Japanese products online. And that's why I started Bento Co in 2008, selling Bento boxes and Japanese kitchenware uh, online. And in 2016, we started um, um, a solution called Ship & Co. We made it for us, for Bento & Co, to manage our shipments because we have customers worldwide and we, we needed a way to, come to, 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 to link uh, our shop, which is on Shopify and Japan Post, DHL and so on. I can talk more about yeah. that later. Actually, let, yeah, let's yeah. take <laughs> one piece at a time because sure. those are already a lot. Um, so let's jump in a little bit with Bento & Co. So I have heard your story that you were at Kyoto University and you stayed on to start this company. Did you go straight from being a student to being a founder of the No, course? No. Um, so like I spent one year in Kyoto University and that was enough for me to get... So was this an exchange program? Yes, from yes. Okay. So it was one year. Yep. And I went, went back to France for two months, got graduated and I wanted to go back to Japan as soon as possible. So I, I, I took a working holiday visa. Mm, right. One. Just, you know, I wanted to spend one more year. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, but if, and from the beginning, I don't know why, I just felt that there's some chance here and like some opportunities I could mm -hmm. catch. And um, so, you know, while I was working a holiday, on working a holiday, I, I, I did some, a lot of baito, but I wanted to start my own business. I had the ideas, I tried to import wine, I tried okay, so the other way around. I did some um, 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 blog writing, uh, you know, job as well. I would wanted to do something my, by myself. Okay, so you really wanted to become an entrepreneur. Yes. The question was, in what? It was not even then. a word, you know, back then. <laughs> no, but I mean, it was really a different time. Yep. You know, as almost not really Facebook yet for everyone. Yeah, and. And so when I started my blog in 2005, like, you know, like blogging was the thing. I, I had a blog back then And too. I was on Typepad. I don't know if you remember that, but you know. What was I? I was on Zanga. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I, I started on Blogger and then Typepad. And like, you know, the blogging was a thing and I even started to do some podcasts. Mm. I mean, uh, and it was fun. Yeah. And just doing that, even if I didn't get any revenue from it, just like, I would spend like, I think at least two hours per day. Uh, okay. Blogging, taking pictures, um, yeah. What What was your blog covering? Mostly, like personal blog, but mm -hmm. not like no selfie. It's just like <laughs> things, selfies didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> things I saw, things I my thought about Japanese cultures, politics, or like the the bar next to my house. You know, okay. okay. Quite broad, but you know, life in Japan, life in Kyoto, mm -hmm. and thanks to that, I. I got pretty like a, like a f from like you know, hundreds to like a thousand of unique visitors every day, hmm. and um, and and also like a lot actually of people who mostly from France, when they came to Kyoto to visit Kyoto, like they wanted to meet me, 
and I got a lot of very good connections thanks to that. Mm. You know, like some journalists, they wanted to do like a documentary about something in Kyoto, so they contacted me. Um, there's like some guy I met, and his wife became like a very, f a very famous uh, writer after that. Um, I got a lot of connections, and all these connections that we actually really helped me a lot when I started Bento and Co. So okay. blogging was like my hobby. Um, it was very interesting. I loved that. And what I didn't know is like three years after that, it what made possible uh, starting my business. Okay. So I, I feel like we almost have to explain what blogging is to the audience who are relatively new to this world. Um, but let's not get there. I assume everyone knows what blogging is. Uh, so actually, yeah, tell us how you went from blogging to starting a company. Okay. So, you know, my blog was popular and that was like, getting emails every day yeah. and people oh, I love Japan oh, I want they want to know more about Japan I just say okay I should sell Japanese product because like people who read my blog they're all in France they like Japan they are interested into Japanese culture so I should just sell something from Japan but that was the idea and I didn't know what to sell <laughs> but I just knew okay I, there's something here and I think like for about a year or so yeah. I was just like you know thinking about that and just at that time, like Shopify launched. So yep. they launched in 2006 and mm -hmm. I was uh, actually in their beta. I was a beta tester as well. There's a friend wow. of a friend who saw like someone talk about it on, on Ruby on Rails mm -hmm. forum probably when they launched Shopify. So I created an, I got an account and actually at that time I was work, even working for a small business in Osaka and I did their uh, online store on Shopify in 2006-07. Yeah. So, so you were very much at the beginning of the trend. I was of early the user of many, uh, <laughs> many yeah. apps, many solutions. Yeah. So it's so weird to think that like you can start a business just by writing content now, because it feels like the other way around now, where people are trying to sell something and then they have to write all this content to advertise, yeah. because content marketing is so much about. I mean, you have to do that these days. Exactly. Do you feel like to a certain extent you came at the right timing, or dare I use the word lucky? Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm lucky. I'm, I mean, I was just, it was a different time and it's like true, like a lot, a lot of time people ask me some advice and say, I'm sorry, I, I can't. I mean, I just like wrote my blog for three years before starting my blog, uh, my, my, my e-commerce. Mm -hmm. And it's because, you know, like I have these contents and so I have people like following me for like years or months, but these people online just trusted me. And so people who read my blog became my first customers. Mm. And, and actually, when I got the idea to sell bento boxes, and I think it was like in September, October 2008, from the beginning, I, I talked about it on my blog. I said, oh, I'm going to start a, a, a shop selling bento boxes. And, you know, next week, oh, I got my, my first stock and I took pictures of the products and I showed that on my blog. Just like all the process, I didn't keep anything secret. For me, like, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to, you know, I have this great idea. I don't want to talk too much about it. People can, don't, don't be afraid of that. You know, just like I shared everything on my blog and other people just talk about it. Oh, there's this French guy in Kyoto and he's going to start, you know, uh, e-commerce selling bento boxes. And thanks to that, when we launched Bento & Co, after 20 minutes, I got first order. And every day since then, so 12 years now, we got orders like every day. So give, give me a scale of what the start was like. Cause actually, um, I've heard the story that your first stock was actually just bought from Loft, right? No, I went to Loft to check bento boxes yeah. and I saw uh, the boxes, the brand, the maker's name. Yeah. And so um, my wife is Japanese. She contacted the makers. We got a catalog and we ordered for like Goman yen of stock. Okay, but still very small stock. Yeah. yeah. So and, probably talking... And of course, I mean, yeah, we are not like a Kabushiki Aisha yet. So like, I you know, this thing is, okay, well, why these foreigners want to buy bento boxes? <laughs> <laughs> Go money. And so like, you know, Chakubarai, of course. And uh, yeah. it was fun. But yeah, it was, you know, like a very small stock. And we sold everything. And after a few days, we ordered again and again. But like, basically, yeah, I started with Go money on mm -hmm. stock. And that's all. And like, friends and, and wife, like, supporting me. 
mm. uh, even more than that, like to start a business. Mm. And for all the audience outside of Japan listening to this, Gomai yen is 50,000 yen, which is probably about $450 or 400 euros, so very low start. Um, also, again, scale-wise, like how many readers were your blog having around that point? We're talking 10,000, 100,000? No, no, a thousand. So a couple of thousand. I, I have a thousand u- unique visitors every day. Okay. So I, I don't know, actually. No. Uh, but yeah, probably like about 10,000 yeah, per month. I would say a few, yeah, 20, 20, 30,000 unique okay. visitors. And how much of that turned into bento box sales? Like what was your turnaround? Not, not only in like profit, but how many units were you shipping out every day? I mean, the first day maybe we got like ten to twenty orders. Right, because people were. But it's good. I mean, like, like for I mean, when you start e-commerce, yep. with like no money at all, like you know, advertising. Mm. Um, of course, we started AdWords a few months after that, but there's nothing, nothing, no ads on Facebook at that time. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was so just from the blog and over bloggers talking about it. So the word kind of generally spread. Yes. As a result. Um, and was it from there? Was it just exponential growth? Give, give us a little bit of like drama. Were there any challenges or was it that yeah, was smooth so sailing? We got more and more orders and the, at, at, at the beginning of the site was only in French and other bloggers from the States talk about us and we got more and more customers like requesting a, a website in English. So we launched mm-hmm. the uh, Benton going English in 2010. Also, it was first and only in French. Yeah. I just ah. started with, you know, what is simple for me. Okay. Yeah. I'm from France. My readers are in France. Uh, let's sell in French in Europe. That's it. Using Shopify. All right. I, I, I mean, you know, I really started just like, okay, just want to make it simple. 10 to 15 products just in French, just like, you know, like the most, the easiest way possible for me um, to do. And, and so I didn't, you know, use so much, too much of my money. Right? I would say like about mm. $500. And, and to buy some stock and Shopify was free. It was less, you know, based on commission at that time, no, mm-hmm. not even monthly plan. So, yeah. All right. Um, then from there, I got to ask, you said 2005 you came here, you were here for a year. Uh, I'm trying to figure out the timeline. 2008 still a while back. Like, were you still on the visa? Or so I got, I got married just two months before starting the internal so I just, my wife is Japanese, so ah, okay. I so didn't you have any visa, visa issue to think yeah. of. But like creating the company, I mean, no one asked me for my you know passport. Mm. I got a lot of questions. Oh, you're foreigners. How did you do? I mean, I didn't really care. I mean, first, when we started Benton Co, it was not even like a Kabushiki Geisha. It was not incorporated. Mm. Um, so, Kojin Jigyo. Yes, Kojin Jigyo. So, sole proprietor. In yes. So, the only things I did is uh, the day, like, you know, on a... Friday evening, I got this idea, I'm going to sell bento boxes. Monday morning, I went to the tax office mm. of Sakyoku, mm. Sakyo World Office in, in Kyoto and said, I'm going to start to sell online. I said, thank you, uh, just give us your address. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. And so that's why I, how I it started, like, you know. Uh, and um, a couple of years after that, in, in February 2010, we got incorporated because we, we got an accountant after a few, six months mm. to help, you know, and, and after, you know, way. and... Yeah, and um, and said, yeah, you got too much money now. You need to be incorporated to, to pay less taxes. Mm. So I actually don't know who, like, where our visitors or viewers come from today. But yesterday during the Kyoto International Entrepreneurs Community, we actually had a decent number of people who were abroad interested in coming to Japan. And I think part of that was Jetro talking about the startup visa. Mm. But one of the things that came up yesterday with the entrepreneur from Canada was that yeah, Japan's not particularly easy with paperwork. But what you just mentioned to me it was actually kind of counter to that because you just go to the office, sign a couple of paperwork. I'm guessing you had your wife help you with the Japanese side of things, or are you, were you fluent by, in Japanese at that point? I was not fluent, um, but I would say like to start. I mean, like as a sole proprietor, as mm-hmm. just you need just you need, just need you, your address. I mean, if you don't sell like alcohol or kind of food, you mm-hmm. don't really need any license to sell something. Yeah, bento boxes never killed anyone. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, it was pretty easy. Now, of course, you're going to need Japanese if you want to do business in Japan. Mm. You know, like for, I mean, if you work in Germany, you need German. Well, even yeah. if, if a lot of people speak, speak English there. So, of course, but like, 
I don't feel like Japan is like hard to um, when I compare when I hear like some mystery, some 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 story from actually from France. I maybe now it's easier, but back then, like ten years ago, it was much more difficult to to create like a company in France than in Japan. And actually, it's it's a funny story because someone in France, a, a woman exact same age, got the exact same ID hmm? at the same time. She wanted to sell bento boxes, yeah. Japanese bento boxes in France, and uh, but it took her like six months to you know create her company. I think she just took more time. She wanted to make it almost perfect from the beginning. For me, it was like, I just want to launch. I want to sell bento boxes. I'm going to buy some stock. I'm, I want to open like a very simple website. And I just went to the tax office to, to you know, to start the business legally. Yeah. And so it was done in three weeks. Everything was done in three weeks. Was this your first try? Yeah. Because earlier on, you mentioned that you were trying to import wine or like there are other attempts you so seem to have. So I had ideas, but nothing uh, legally like, you know, no incorporation like the wine thing is just like oh i saw very nice uh bottle design and from and, and not expensive from france just contacted the winemaker and sent me some sample i tried to solve them and it did not work at all. <laughs> I just just no i, I just have the you know um, the envy uh, i wanted to do something yeah it is first try yeah so i guess one of the advantages you had was that your all your clients were abroad and all your sources are in Japan. Yes. Because one of the things you hear is that it's kind of hard to do business in Japan because of the language. But I guess if you're just sourcing bento boxes from companies, they will sell it to you. Exactly. If they want to carry that stock. Yeah, I, I think at, at, at the beginning, some of the makers like were, you know, just not suspicious, but they just like, oh, yeah, why this guy wants to sell bento boxes? Because even in their mind, they made bento boxes to sell in Japan. Yeah. And this even the makers they just see the, their own product as something very traditional that couldn't be exported or maybe mm. in china and korea but you know but like western countries like sending better boxes no we didn't thought about it and and so after a year or so one of the biggest makers we we work with they just came to my place and mm. was still like a home <laughs> <laughs> you know i was renting a, a house like Two, two, two floors and we were walking on the first floor and living up the upstairs and they came and they wanted to meet us and, and talk more and they, they, were, they, said, they just said they were very surprised like you mm. know that a constant growth like every month we order more and more from them so all right so there's definitely that part of like who are you selling it to that I want to follow up on but I just realized I need to clarify two things to the audience um, for people who are coming from abroad they may not know what a bento box is so actually, do you want to explain that? Oh, anyone knows that. I mean, it's just a box to put your food in, um, lunch, mostly usually lunch, and and to yeah to eat outside mm. at home uh, at the office or in a park. And um, one of the thing about the Japanese culture for lunch boxes is like it's not only like um, a container you're gonna put food in it, uh, you know read in the microwave and then eat in a in a plate it's not like a tupperware it's like yeah. you you put the food inside so it looks nice as well it's, i think it's really part of the culture oh yeah and um and usually because people don't use like fork and knife especially in a in a in a plastic box you pre-cut everything so it's easy to to eat with your, your chopsticks and if you're for anyone who's listening if you're interested google bento box or bento art because there are mm. amazing things that Japanese people do with these boxes and how pretty the food looks. So I lived in the US. Most of our packed lunches weren't even boxes, they were bags. Mm. How is this actually in France? Mm, I mean, so at school, there's no, no one has bento box because usually... The school takes care of all of them? Yeah. Okay. You have, you know, um, a self-restaurant for kids or like you yeah, go back home. Yeah. Yeah. Two hours. Mm. So... And then people you you, you just need a, a lunch to go only when you go out, you know, for the day. Uh, so you need a, a picnic. But yeah, there's no there's no culture about bento box for kids and adults. A lot of people just cook and bring their food at, at, at the office. Okay. Because it's it's much cheaper, you know, especially yeah. in Paris. If you want to go to go eat outside, it takes cost yeah. fifty euros. Uh, so yeah, it's a bit expensive. So a lot of people actually cook and bring food at the office. But like they don't eat inside the box, 
It was not part of the culture, you know. You just you use a box to to bring food, but then you put the, the food inside a plate, yeah, and you eat in a plate. And it's what's more, or like you have a sandwich, right. <laughs> right? So more and more I hear this, more and more this is not fit for the European market. Yeah, exactly. Who were your customers? What were and, you using this for? It was interesting because you could still see on my blog the day I said I'm going to start to sell bento boxes. Mm -hmm. I say uh, two or three people comments on my blog post said it will never sell. Mm. People don't need this. I well, mean, that's probably what your sources were saying too. This, and yeah, and some people said they didn't really believe in me. So, uh, I don't care. I mean, basically, in any cultures, any countries, there's people who like to cook food for themselves or for someone, and they need to bring food somewhere. Mm. And we sell ben we sell bento boxes. So country, no, now, number one is the US actually. Okay. And I well, think biggest like, country too. Yeah, it's a huge market, mm -hmm. and I f I just get there's a lot of mum who wants their kids to to eat more healthy, and and they pa and they need to pack some food in a nice box. We need some. We so also have a lot of um, wholesale customers. I mean, we do a lot of B two B as well now, mm -hmm. and uh, we sell some bento boxes to um, restaurants and hotels mm -hmm. and catering. Mm. Uh, companies as well. So I'm guessing those are like bigger boxes yeah, that yeah, like the shokado not what kids type, the same yeah. as you can see in like traditional ryokan, so um, guest house and mm. hotel in West in Japan. Yeah. So I guess this gets at this notion that uh, so I've heard this story. I'm sure you've heard of it. A man goes to a country to try to sell shoes, or one guy goes to a country to sell shoes, and he sees that no one is wearing shoes, and he comes back and saying it's hopeless. No one wears shoes here. And another guy comes back saying, this is a fantastic opportunity, no one wears shoes here. But at least with the current startup trend of like, you must have a customer, you must have a need you're addressing, there should be like an, at least some kind of target. Like it, it, what you did was very counter to that. Um, I didn't thought, I didn't make any business plan. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I was really lucky. The timing was everything. So. I have this blog, so already I already have like you know like a, a pool of people who were interested in Japanese cultures anyway. So I could have sell something else from Japan. It could have worked from the beginning at first. Mm -hmm. But what was good with the bento box is this Lehman shock and the financial crisis mm -hmm. of 2008. Okay. So, yep. um, so just more and two more months, people are trying to save just money. Just two months before I launched Bento and Co. Uh, yeah, financial crisis in many countries, just people start wanting to save money and eating outside at for lunch, you know, it costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So more and more people actually started to cook their own food to bring at, at work, if they have work. And so like the trend was perfect. Mm -hmm. Another thing like of the timing is like in, in France, but as well other countries, you know, like um, you've got all this um, TV show, like Top Chef, Master Chef, who are very trendy. And so, like you know, like this homemade cook and homemade, like uh, yeah, every you want to cook for yourself or for your friends or for your family, mm -hmm. and this is a, a very um, it's not only a trend because if it has been like for 15 years now on TV now on Netflix on YouTube you got all this show about like cooking, yeah. and so like cooking at home is like really back uh, since about 15 years, and people want to eat healthy, and they want to. And they enjoy cooking food mm. as well. And they spend more and more like buying tools for, for cooking. And bento box is one of these uh, items that you need if you, you know, if you prepare a really nice meal and you want to bring outside, you need a nice box as well. So you're touching upon a theory I have that over the last 20 years, hobbies that require a lot of information has seen massive growth. Um, thanks to the internet. So cooking is one of them. Hiking is another one because you get a lot more tr information about trails. Yeah. Um, I, it's true. A lot of people have become foodies over the last 20 years, both in cooking and as well as, I mean, thanks to Yelp or Taberogu yeah. or TripAdvisor. Traveling is another one yeah. of those as well as we well got to see in the city until the Corona shock kind of um, turned things down. Actually, let's switch to the city. Mm. Why do you love Kyoto? I, I think it's easy to leave. It's easy to leave? Yeah. Except the weather, especially today. Oh, live. Okay, sorry, so you said leave. No, yeah, live. To live. Um, it's not a big town for Japan, mm. I would say. Uh, compared to France, it's quite a big, large city. Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, Kyoto in France would be like the number two or number yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's population is the same as Lyon, I think. So that, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's everything you need. A really nice restaurants, cafe everywhere. The food is, is amazing. Um, and, and you don't feel you, you are in a city because almost from everywhere you can see the mountain, you can, you can go to Camo mm -hmm. River. So you feel, you know, in a city, we need every, you have everything, but it's a bit of countryside as well. So that's why I think okay. uh, I like this place. And you discovered that when you were a student? Yeah, yes, absolutely. And you were just like, all right, this is the place I want to be. I just feel good. I didn't thought, to, I mean, just like a, a month or so before like uh, starting Benton to go, actually, I was looking for like a real job as well. And <laughs> I went to Tokyo to, to pass some interview. Mm -hmm. I was so depressing. I'm really happy they didn't hire me. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, where, where are you from in France? Are you from uh, Paris? No, I'm from Saint Etienne, so it's near Lyon, middle okay. of France, about the south. Okay. That, considering I've never heard of it, I'm guessing it's a small village. Maybe not that small. No, it's I, <laughs> not for France, like a mm -hmm. number seven <laughs> city. It's not okay. so far from Lyon. Yeah. It's famous for football. So, kind of like the suburb area. What do you miss from France? I'm sure you get this question a lot. Of uh, cheese. Cheese, cheap, good wine, and um, the countryside. I really love French countryside. Mm -hmm. But you know, I really love France. I'm I'm good in Japan. I love to work here, and I'm really happy when I go, can go back to France for some vacation. But I don't see myself working mm -hmm. in France. Do you sell, see yourself working in a Japanese company? Probably not anymore. No, not anymore. Did you see yourself back then? I I I worked in a small company in Osaka for almost two years. I, yeah, I mean, it was a small company, so this was not so traditional and so kind of a new company as well. But no, I don't, I, it might be difficult. But I don't know, we never say never. <laughs> yeah. Well, because, so, I actually don't know, but I don't know if you know, I lived in France for two yeah, years. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> so I must say, like, the lifestyle that you guys have of taking a vacances for one month in the summer it's just unimaginable with my like lifestyle or exactly. seeing Japanese people's lifestyle here where like taking a week, more than a week off, you feel guilty. Yes. Which I'm hoping I'm not scaring too much of the international audience. Um, the second thing I forgot to mention is for anyone who's actually listening, uh, please feel free to put any questions on the live chat and I will we'll bring it into the conversation here. I also realized I need to set this to live chat. There you go. Okay, so it should be showing up there as well. Um, I'm just wondering where we should, we should jump next. So we talked about Kyoto. Actually, let's get to your next business venture, Ship & Co. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about okay, it. Okay, so uh, Ben Tonko was doing good. We, we ship every, every orders from here, actually. Yeah. So second floor, we have a warehouse. And so we use Japan Post, DHL, FedEx, UPS. And so there's no good way at that time to get our orders data from Shopify to Japan Post or FedEx or DHL. Mm -hmm. I tried a few apps from the States, but they did not really work for us in Japan. They were just like meant to be used for like US-based customers shipping domestically. So we got this idea, okay, we should do that ourselves. And one of the French uh, staff still working with me uh, is a, was a developer. I said, okay, can, can you do that? And so I got this idea, like, let's try to connect Shopify with FedEx, DHL, UPS, and Japan Post. Okay. And that's what we did. It took a lot of time. So when you um, say connect, what, you connect the database and so all we made a We made an app yeah. and we connect with Shopify now over like Amazon, eBay, and mm -hmm. some Japanese um, e-commerce platforms, like Yahoo Shopping, mm -hmm. uh, Base, uh, Kalami from GMO. We use their API, so if you sell something on one of these store and you use our app, you get all your orders synchronized into Ship and Co. Mm. And from Ship and Co, you can manage shipping with DHL, FedEx, UPS, or like local carrier uh, okay. in Japan. So it's really a let's say behind the scene process optimization. Yes, it's it's an app you use uh, in your warehouse. Yeah. When you have something to ship, you need to print the shipping labels. And you need to put the shipping labels on, on the box, right? Mm -hmm. And still now, even some big companies, they do like this handwriting or like they, 
they, ex- they can export like uh, it's not only in Japan actually. It's yeah. In actually, countries. for international shipments, I'm actually used to seeing handwritten mailing yeah, address. A lot, right? Yeah. And more and more like carriers wants to stop this because even if it's handwritten, they have to scan it and they have to put this into data. So it's a huge mm. pain for them. So this is what we did. First, we did that for us for Bento and Co. and connected our shop with the carriers we used and. Slowly, we added more and more shops, marketplaces, and carriers. And so now, Shipanko is the only solution of that kind in Japan. We connect with about 10 different shop systems and marketplaces, and about uh, 10 uh, shipping carriers. I'm guessing you've also, I'm guessing that you have competitors in Japan that operate within Japan for domestic shipping. No. Really? Actually, no. So. We are still the only solution doing that. We're still the only solution to, if you want to create like a Yamato or Sagawa, which are the biggest uh, shipping yeah. carriers in Japan, if you want to create a Yamato or Sagawa um, shipping labels outside of their own system, yeah. it's just ship and go. Okay. So like, it's another story maybe, but like getting the API, access to the API of these two carriers yeah took me about more than a year of negotiation because they don't have any API open to any developers to use. And now this is probably the area where you really had to get Japanese with your interaction with people to get things through. How did you do it? Uh, Shitsukoi, it's a word in Japanese. (laughs) How do you say that? Uh, Persistent in an annoying way, let's say. Kind of. And I think, yeah, so um, it's all about uh, connections. I got once invited to like this event, uh, logistics events by this consulting group and v- venture capitals in Tokyo. Went there. The guy sitting next to me was uh, like a manager in one of his uh, uh, companies, and he introduced me to someone else, to someone else. And after like maybe ten meetings, they accepted to 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 for to to use their API into Shipman Co. Yeah. What's your business model? Uh, subscription. Mostly. Okay, so you pay. So if you use Ship and Co, so. like every month, we yeah we charge yeah. you based on your uh, level volume of shipments. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So okay, a couple yen or tens of yen per shipping. Thirty yen or like between f- one thousand yen to uh, thirty thousand yen, depending on the volume. And we also have like large customers uh, who have like you know customized plan. So, wow. I'm actually really surprised to hear that there are no other players in Japan yet. Like, I feel like this is a natural place where people jump in because uh, I've seen competitors abroad. You, yeah. So in in the US, you have ShipStation, Shippo, Shipping Easy, Easy Ship, and also some like a few couple of uh, very nice apps made in Australia, mm-hmm. one in Hong Kong. But in Japan, no. There's like two services, but just for eBay, mm-hmm. and uh, they connect just with DHL, or just with FedEx. Okay. Uh, but like a solution like us connected with eBay, Shopify, Rakuten, Yahoo, Amazon, and both local and international carriers is just, just ship and go for now. Hopefully it stays that way. I mean, for sure, like uh, we, we, some competitors will get, yeah, but I know it, it, like technically it's not easy. Mm. I mean, like uh, integrating API of car, uh, shipping carriers is it, takes time and if you don't understand if you don't know the shipping process it's really hard for developers mm. you can you can be a very good developer but if you haven't shipped yourself package, oh, and I guess this is your unfair advantage is the exactly fact that you've we've got this, a lot of we this. have this experience of yeah. shipping with Benton Co. so we know we know how it works behind the like technically as well and we also when we build ship and co we build with you know staff in the warehouse asking what do you think about the UI and, and this is also very important as well. So I can't help it but notice the stark contrast between your first startup, e-commerce, let's just try it, to a much more focused like here's a target customer, here's the pain point, software service, in an area that I thought was crowded but is not. And it's SAAS, like it's a very different type of business model and industry you're jumping into. It's completely different. But even for Ship and Co, I didn't make any business plans at first. Like we needed it for us, so we did mm. it for us first, and we saw it works like very nice. And we've got you know some connections, some friends on Shopify in Japan as well. So we want mm. to try it, and they tried. So oh, I want this, 
and so it's you know it's it started you know slowly as well and um but yeah now it's not it's not the end it's just starting for me even if we <laughs> really launch it the beta in four years ago now almost four years um we went out of beta in 2018 mm -hmm. and um yeah there's so much things to do now and finally after four years and a lot of hard work and a lot of uh you know trying many things i we finally got what we need to focus on actually even for for ship and co mm -hmm. and we finally got our first very large uh, company using it so it's um it's um it's very exciting for what's next mm. can can i ask what kind of company you don't have to say the name but oh like very big uh, trading company in japan mm. okay. as well as some actually carriers in japan are very interested to use our solution inside their warehouse mm. so you don't come from this world of software development can you program no so how did you manage to assemble the network and the right people to actually start getting this to happen? Um, I want to believe that I understand what can be done by programming. Mm. Well, actually, what's your academic background? Uh, political sciences. Okay, so not very connected. Yeah. <laughs> I just, you know, I'm curious about a lot of things. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and I know like sociology and politics is very important and it helped me a lot to, 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 you know, to negotiate and to understand, like, you know, you, you go to Yamato or to Japan Post head office in Tokyo. It's, it was so exciting for me. And, and try to find the white <laughs> the dragon stand, yeah. guy to, to talk with and, and slowly get what you need. It's all about politics. <laughs> but anyway, um, no, so like I was lucky as a, one of, uh, now he's the lead developers of Ship and Co. I found him on Twitter. So uh, I needed some mm. like a graphic designer to work mm. for Bento and Co. So in 2014, and I just on my Twitter I can't say oh I'm hiring someone and he replied to me. He was living in France, but he came to Japan like seven times before that you know, as a tourist. So wow. he loved Kyoto. Yeah. I said okay, and just a few couple of months after that he sold everything in France and came here with his wife living in Japan. And so and he knew about uh, a little bit about programming. And he learned a lot while doing Ship and Co, I guess, as well. So, so in the about 10 years in between you started Bento and Co and Ship and Co, there's been a huge movement towards the startup world with money, investors, city governments jumping into it. There's a lot more support network now. Are you actually using them or is it mostly noise? I'm, I'm almost curious because I'm not an entrepreneur. Like, is, it, is the stuff that the city provide and... Um, I'm not going to name organizations, but are they helping? Um, sometimes, yes. I mean, Jetro in Kyoto, we did um, very nice online seminars on YouTube with Shopify to mm -hmm. talk about how to, you know, sell online for um, international sh and doing international shipping and so on. So, and, and and thanks to that, I got a few connections, a few customers for Ship and Co. So, like, it was it's same. It depends on on the right people, mm -hmm. but yeah, sometimes it's nice, but. Um, yeah, Kyoto, Kyoto City, Kyoto Prefectures. Uh, I have some contacts, and, and sometimes they, yeah, they, they, they provided me like with great. I wouldn't say support, but you know, like connections, mm. introductions to, to, talk, you know, customers or like people we can other companies we can work work with. So, but there's a lot of noise. I feel. The, <laughs> uh, I mean when you see yourself as a startups and you need to raise money and you i met a lot of venture capital just here and i mm. i really feel now that i lost my time a lot. <laughs> and i try to not to do, don't you do a lot of you know events mm. outside now because i mean chipanko and Tonko keep me very very busy and um and the more I work, the more I understand what I need to focus on. And I know that some events sometimes didn't bring any good things to me. I'm not mm. even sure I, I was happy to share any good to people who listen to me. So, yeah. Well, and this, so I'm on the kind of the other side in the sense that I do go to a lot of the events. I do help put on some of them, mostly for students. And I am noticing that there is kind of this two layer of the people who want to be in the spotlight, who want to be sort of 
being cheered on by these, all these admirers who are interested in startups. And then I think there are the founders who are just really focused down, heads on the ground, trying to get stuff going. And I, I always thought you were on that side because I don't oh, see you at too many events. Mm. Maybe you're actually at different events than I am, but... Yeah, I, I did. I mean, we did our own event, actually, a lot last year. Right. Uh, since two years, actually, we did some Shopify meetups and meetups talk about logistics and e-commerce mm. in Kyoto, in Tokyo, in Nagoya. In, I mean, almost every month we had like one event organized by ourselves, even in Singapore. So, but yeah, we, we like doing this event ourselves, you know, you can control and, you know. And what was the goal? To, you know, to talk about, if we talk about Shopify and logistics, then naturally you can talk about shop, shop and go. Yeah, people are interested to sell online, mm. so they, they might be our customers. Okay, yeah, so that's like the straight up event yeah. type reasons of doing it. But I also did some events uh, for students. Yep. Doshisha or Kyoto University, mm. and I, I really enjoyed that. So maybe, you know, or maybe I can, I can meet some students um, that could be interested to work with me. I think it actually happened last year. Mm. So. Yeah, I'm wondering where... So I grew up in the U.S. a lot, and there was very much like a pay-it-forward mentality, mm. which I don't quite see as much in Japan. Mm. I, I don't actually know what France is like with regards to the notion of pay-it-forward, but there's a lot more like volunteering that, like real volunteering that happens in the U.S. Oh, yeah. Versus in Japan, it seems like volunteering, but there's always like an alternative motive to get people to do something mm. with it. I mean... I'm not in France for like since. Oh, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> I've been there time, more so recently than you have. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, and it's getting a <laughs> bit. Say, but like for, I mean, I wouldn't like you know. I was so I I was happy to do some events and some. I even be like a, be a judge on like some pitch contest last year. But I felt it weird because I wasn't even myself pitching to some VCs, and I don't consider myself as a successful at all. <laughs> oh, you are. <laughs> no, I know. I'm no. Come on. I mean, if it was like there's so many issues and it's so busy and you know you have staff quitting, new new staff to to hire and and the money is always you know you have to there's so many things to do. So I I don't I would never be satisfied. But I guess like if if you're an entrepreneur, you're never satisfied. Mm. But I have a lot of reason to not be satisfied now. I'm really happy. I don't regret any things, and I'm really about happy about my situation. I'm really mm. positive. But like, sometimes when I got like, how oh, can you be judged on this like, pitch contest? Said, Why me? No, come higher. Like, just ask this for a VC because <laughs> maybe even might be interested to invest, but I have no money to invest. Hey, at least That's you're an entrepreneur. Point. I'm a professor and I get invited sometimes and I really feel out of place. I, I would love to be a professor sometimes. That's something I actually I would love to do is if I can consider myself as successful in 10 years or 15 years, mm -hmm. maybe to, you know, yeah, talk about that. Um, at university to some students to high school right. I would if love we're to in the that. same city I'll gladly call on you then. let's talk again in 10, 10 years yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well actually okay so now we're talking about the future um, you're very much in the middle of growing Ship & Co right now right yeah. um, you, you didn't raise funding I think I saw it on Facebook yes. okay so if you're on the let's say start trajectory of trying to grow large yeah we needed money to, we need more developers <laughs> so yeah where's money um, early 2018 uh, 100 million yen, so about 1 million dollars yeah. less. And, uh, so C day. Yeah, right and um, we raised a bit more um, early VC actually in mm. February. Um, all from Japanese investors? Yes. So, okay, this is your time to pitch then. What are you looking for right now? Oh. It sounds like you have the money. People? No, I don't, I don't have all the money I, I thought I wanted last year. Yeah. But with all the situation, with Corona, actually, by staying in my office like for weeks. Last year, I was in Tokyo, or like in Singapore, every month. Almost. Mm -hmm. I was in Tokyo actually now, two or three times a month, and I went to Singapore because also incorporated in Singapore last year, mm -hmm. actually. Uh, also, you're internationalizing your business as well. Uh, yeah. Because it, at first, actually, we did the Singapore incorporation because one of the staff working for us in Kyoto asked to move to Singapore. I wanted to capture her, so we, but because she's Japanese, we need to, to, to be incorporated there for yep. to, to work legally and get a visa. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, 
So yeah, I was out of the office a lot. I met with 40 different venture capitals. Uh, I met with a lot of partners. And, but thanks to Corona, I kept focus here in Kyoto and I finally got it what we need to focus on to get more and more customers. So I'm so curious to ask. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to, I mean, simple example. We wanted to, to, to integrate more and more API. Um, but we, we got like, okay, let's say like 80% of our customers, they use DHL, they use FedEx, they use Japan Post. In Japan, they use Sagawa and Yamato. Let's try to focus here. Let's try to add more options and more features to satisfy mm, okay. our current user and, mm. and heavy user who don't use us yet because they see us as like a, um, a solution for small, for small businesses. Yeah. So I think we have a question. Yep. Subsidies, grants, and acceleration in Japan often focus on improving the community. Have you ever used any? I don't think you've been part of any acceleration programs, right? No. Um, have for, you thought about mental, it, uh, grant, No. I mean, every time we got some, you know, uh, flyers about grants and so on, it did, Ship & Co. didn't really fit inside. Mm. So it did not work for us. Um, but for Bento & Co., actually, many of our makers um, got some grants from the prefectures because they produced something and thanks to that we did some trade shows abroad a lot actually. Mm, okay so you worked with people that did get grants. Yeah and when you are not a maker actually, when you don't have, when you don't build like an object it's, it's hard to get some grants. So both Bento and Go and Ship and Co you've never actually received any subsidies or grants from the government? I don't think so. Okay, that's quite surprising because so many Japanese businesses do, and we I, we except once actually yeah for trade shows, mm. so like it paid about like half, a travel cost yeah half of the travel cost and and, and booths mm. uh, yeah because it's interesting here that you're it sounds like you're very honest about like okay this grant's not for me this grant's not for me mm. um, being on the other side being in the public sector and seeing. I'm not going to go into details where I know all of this, but I see a lot of like applications that are mismatched with the grant intention that still kind of gets through. I mean, with Corona, I've got a lot of talk about that, you know. Oh, I'm, please send me a, a quote to build a new website. I don't care. I need the quote tomorrow because I'm doing the, the application to get a grant. Yep, and there's a lot of that. Going on. Seen, and, and I know like some guys here, like, you know, they got to get, they're going to pay like 2 million, 3 million yen to get uh, their website to work on smartphone because they thought they need to pay for that mm -hmm. instead of some, using a more modern solution and, and get some grant for that. I mean, I just, you know, keep focus on what you do and maybe there's a grant for you, maybe not, mm -hmm. but yeah. <laughs> How about accelerators? Um, same, I mean, um, we didn't need that. For, I mean, when I started Bento I didn't know anything about mm -hmm. VC and... and uh, you were a blogger. Yeah, I was a blogger. It was in 2008. Yeah. I'm not even sure I was like a VC in Kansai at that time. There was one, but maybe, yeah, not maybe, much. Yeah, maybe mm -hmm. Jafco or something. But yeah, um, no. And for Ship and Co, I mean, we had an office already and we, sh we have the developers for Ship & Co and staff working in marketing a customer report for, for Bento Co share the same office. Mm. So we didn't really need like a space. Mm. And, and frankly, I, didn't, I don't think there's like any, anyone who could really help us with what we, we do. And a lot of accelerators made, we have some accelerators now made by some large logistics related company, Hitachi or Yamato, maybe uh, and over Seino, maybe they did some. But we don't want to get any color. We mm. work with Sagawa, we work with Yamato, we work with FedEx, DHL. And so we need to be quite open about that as well. So, yeah. So it sounds like you've been doing a lot of the stuff from the ground up yourself. What was like the most valuable thing you were able to get as a result of being in Kyoto? Maybe the government, the local community, either for Bento & Co or Ship & Co? I guess, I mean, um, I really, for Bento & Co, things I think were like easier to be here, mm. 
because yeah, same for Shippenko actually. People will remind you like easily. Oh, you're from Kyoto. Oh, you're based in Kyoto. So first, so the, first of all, the like city brand. Yeah, um, being in Kyoto just make. I mean, if you do, if I sell bento boxes from Tokyo, it's it's less fun. It's less recognizable as well. But like, oh, there's a French guy in Kyoto selling bento boxes, and and actually, so when we moved here in this office in 2012, um, we opened a store. So that's where we're actually doing this yeah. session right now. <laughs> so we're on the third floor, but the, the ground floor is a, is a store. And when we opened the store, someone, a friend of mine, talked about it on a blog in Japanese, and someone from NHK saw it. And two weeks after that, we've got NHK, like very famous a TV show from Japanese national television called mm -hmm. Salameshi, who came here. Oh, no, no. Yep. Salameshi is great. They okay. talk about Salari, Man, I mean, uh, Hirugo, uh, lunchtime from people. Okay. Everyone. And Bento, yeah, I've seen yes. the connection. And yeah. so Salameshi came here. And this, this show is great, first. They talk about food, and people who love food to eat and to cook. And it was a perfect target. And thanks to that TV show, a lot of people saw it. We got a lot of orders from Japan, and a um, and lot of good connections. And, and journalists from you know, radio, TV, uh, newspaper, magazine, every week for about a year. We, w we went like on every TV, like mm -hmm. after NHK. It was great. So like, thanks to that, yeah, we opened the store. We were not online only anymore. There's a yeah. finally something to show on TV, on, on, on you know, on, even on newspapers. So yeah, even if, if you do that just online, it's not really interesting. But having like being a foreigner in Kyoto, selling some traditional product, Japanese products, it was a good story to talk mm. about it. So I well, think, yeah. Japanese media loves to pick up any sign of foreign people and or culture accepting their own um, and I think this is very much an example of that yeah yeah mm. all right we have one more question uh, but you're not using ex using accelerate program to go international find partners in Singapore no um, I mean Singapore we, we, we incorporated because if we want to work in Singapore, that we, we have, have one have staff, a, you have to, to be incorporated. If you want mm -hmm. to sign some contract with Singapore-based company, you need to mm -hmm. be incorporated. So that's why we did that. And you have Singaporean clients as well now? Uh, we have a few users, yes, in, based in Singapore, and mm -hmm. we work with Singapore Post. We work mm -hmm. with Ninja Van, which is a startup that we just raised $300 million, something like that. Uh, it's um, it's a new. I think they didn't exist ten years ago. It's a it's a new shipping carriers in all mm -hmm. Southeast Asia. So we work with them as well, and we have some clients. Yeah. Hmm. Is this your next strategy? I mean, you don't have to tell me, but to start adding country by country support and no, expanding it. No, because we've got more and more users actually in Italy and Switzerland and Canada and the USA. Okay. And <laughs> I where there are competition. Yes, yeah, and uh, it's so it's great, and I hope we see more, much more in the coming months. But I don't, we don't need enough. Is there? Mm -hmm. I think if if Ship and Co works well, if we have a good UI, if it works in French and English, mm -hmm. we get more and more users uh, elsewhere, and uh, we don't really need an office there anywhere. At maybe if we get bigger and bigger, if we raise mo a lot of money, or if we don't even need to raise money because we have a lot of customers. Maybe you're going to open like a, a, an office in Europe and one mm. in, in Canada, you know, for like customer support and marketing. Mm. But it's not something I'm thinking of right now. Mm. Okay, so first get but the product. But Singapore was interested, yeah, to, to be seen as much more international. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't really cost that much money to have, to open a business there. You know. Were you getting a lot of tax breaks from the government as well over there? No, because we, I mean, all I the revenue paying, actually is yeah, 100%. Here. So it was really on paper to, to have some, uh, someone working for us there. Uh, but all the revenue is, 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 uh, is in Japan. So we pay our tax in Japan. We didn't okay. make any... Thank you. <laughs> we didn't make any, um, like a company based in Singapore to, to, to pay less taxes and so on. So mm. Several are based in Japan. Mm. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you for your time. We're at about 55 minutes. I don't know if there are going to be any more questions, but do you have any last things you want to ask me or say to the audience 
things you're looking for, you'd be like, if you're a programmer, come join us or anything like that? So we are not really hiring right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, true. Uh, um, we got someone new actually from Benton, for Benton Co. and mm -hmm. it's going well. Um, I, I, I guess like instead of looking too much on what you could get outside, uh, just try to focus on what you can do yourself. And it's really something I really, I learned from a start with Bento & Co. is when you want to start your own business, you know, you try to, you talk about that to other people, to some friends, oh, let's do that together. And maybe you're like, maybe this guy can help me. It's important to, to keep a lot of connections because this could like you know, help you in mm -hmm. some way. But when you have to launch, when you have to do it, it's only you. It's a mm -hmm. bit frightening maybe, but it's also ex exciting and, and it's okay if it's not perfect at the beginning. What was it? A winner has 100 friends, but a loser does ha not have any. There's some mm -hmm. saying like that. <laughs> when you're successful, everyone's always around you. But mm -hmm. when you're not, people disappear. Mm -hmm. um, actually, along that lines, I had one more question. Again, getting to the whole you know, shipping code being very, very focused and Bento & Co. something being, I don't want to say you stumbled upon it, but it was very experimental in a start. With how popular startups now, at least on the internet, and how focused people we are, it just feels like there's less and less opportunity of stumbling onto something interesting and then being able to grow that because everyone's already trying to pick the pies that are out there. If there's, say, a younger version of you um, who's, say, studying in Kyoto right now, what that's interested in starting a company in Japan or anywhere, what's the message you'd have for them for them to get started? I'm, I'm sure there's still like tons of ID and it will also depend on the timing. So like just think of, of where you are and what time you are and, and do what you like as well. I wouldn't, I mean, I'm selling bento boxes, not because I'm in, you know, in love with bento boxes, but I love food. I love to cook as well. So, you know, I have an interest into that as well. I, I wouldn't see I, the bento boxes. I, I, I couldn't do like a business. I had some ideas about, like, oh, I should sell this, I'm sure it'll work well. But if I'm not like, you know, if you don't have any passion for it, I'm sure it's really hard. Maybe some people do, but I'm not really good at finance. I'm not really good with money as well, you know. I did something because I was passionate about it. Hmm. And uh, yeah, so I forgot what I wanted to say, but um, I think like if you follow what you like, it's, it makes much more easier to to to, to, to start to stick with it yeah. and and yeah and you need to stick with it to to you know to, to to get some to be successful you know to get more money so you can grow a little bit and, and keep go doing the same thing <laughs> over and over Thomas, thank you so much thank for your you. time this is really interesting thank you everyone for who um everyone who joined us online Hope you guys enjoyed it as well. And just the last bit of announcement for us, we are back online for Startup Weekend Kyoto sessions. So we will be on next week, I believe on Tuesday at 7.30. Please check our website or please check YouTube for this. But we'll be back in Japanese and Minakuchi, the other uh, facilitator in Kyoto, will be talking to Makino-san, Mr. Makino, who is one of the, sorry, who is the founder of a venture capital focusing on hardware in Kyoto, so you're probably hearing a lot of conversation from the other side. And then from that, we're gonna keep doing this until hopefully someday we'll be able to have Startup Weekend, the physical version, again someday. So if you're around in Kyoto, hope to see you sometime and thank you for tuning in. All right, till next time. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.